Hi, I'm Gene Bergman from the old north end of Burlington. And for 20 years, I was an assistant city attorney and senior assistant attorney for the city of Burlington, uh, including being the attorney for the Department of Public Works. And that's important because today we are here to talk trash, solid waste collection and public ownership with Thomas Hanna, the research director of the Democracy Collaborative. And we're discussing this because Burlington is currently discussing moving away from our inefficient and costly fragmented system to a new consolidated system. And we're gonna talk about the advantages of a public not-for-profit democratically controlled system that also promotes the most union jobs with good wages and benefits and also the largest reductions in fossil fuel emissions. So welcome Thomas. Can you tell people a little bit about yourself in the Democracy Collaborative? Sure, and first of all, thank you so much, Gene, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be speaking with you all today on a topic that's really, really close to my heart. Um, the Democracy Collaborative is an R&D lab for a more democratic and equitable economy. We've been around for about 20 years, although our roots go back uh, much further, really into the 1960s through a number of different institutions, as well as the work of our co-founder, Gar Alperovitz, who some of your viewers may know about. And, and probably, Gus, is Gus Spieth uh, also part of it? He's a Vermonter, I hear. Yes, Gus, is, Gus, is, Gus and Gar are the co-chairs of our Next System project, which we might be able to talk about a little bit more. But, uh, but yeah, and, and Gus and Gar both have a lot of connections to Vermont, so I'm sure a lot of people have, have met or know about them. Um, we're, we're probably most well known, I think, for our community wealth building framework, which is really about developing a new paradigm of local economic development that centers alternative models of ownership and control, rather than simply throwing billions of dollars in subsidies at like, you know, large corporations like Amazon or Walmart and so on. And, and a good example of this is some of the work that we did in Cleveland, Ohio, where we helped develop a community controlled cooperative network called the Evergreen Cooperatives. And Evergreen has been really, really successful over the years. It's about 10 years old and now has about five linked worker cooperatives with more than 300 worker owners. And if anyone's interested in the work of the Democracy Collaborative in general or the Evergreen Cooperatives or so on, you can check out our website. It's at democracycollaborative.org. And so, as you mentioned, I'm the research director here at the Democracy Collaborative, and I've been research director for about the past five years or so. Um, and I focus mostly on alternative models of ownership, things like cooperatives, publicly owned enterprises, which we're gonna talk a lot about today, social enterprises, employee owned businesses, and so on and so forth. And along with my colleagues from around the world, I've really tried to develop what, a new model of public ownership, something that we call democratic public ownership. So rather than the sort of old top-down bureaucratic, very managerial forms of public ownership that predominated in, in the 20th century, the, you know, the state-owned enterprise that many people are familiar with, we're really talking about different new 21st century models of public ownership that really combine some of the more democratic and participatory governance and management relationships that you can find in cooperatives and common space enterprises and combining those with the broad-based ownership patterns that I think are really valuable uh, parts of public ownership. So, I, I mean, and I think you wrote a book uh, called Our Commonwealth, The Return of Public Ownership in the United States. Uh, so, yeah, we'll thank, that a thank, little bit. Thank you, thank you for plugging the book. Yeah, that was a book I wrote a couple of years ago and is, I think, very relevant to the conversation today. And so if people want to check that out, it, it really covers the scope and scale of public ownership that many people don't really know about in the United States. So, I guess that leads to the first question, why should anyone care if our trash is collected by the, by the city? And to say it in another way, why is it important that solid waste collection is run by the city in a not-for-profit democratic basis? Yeah, there are, there are many reasons why I think that trash collection should be in public ownership, but first and foremost is really about democratic control. You know, unlike a, a privately owned service, which has really only one overriding goal, and that's to turn a profit. Unlike that, publicly owned services can really be designed according to whatever a local population decides it wants to prioritize. For instance, many publicly owned enterprises around the world and around the United States prioritize lower costs for consumers. Other publicly owned enterprises prioritize revenue generation for the city. So, you know, making money that the city can then use to subsidize other public services or to lower tax burdens for, for residents, for example. And a really good example of both of these, you know, the, the lower costs for consumers, but also uh, 
the revenue generation is the electricity sector, which I think people in Burlington are probably pretty familiar with. But uh, in general, publicly owned electric utilities have been proven by you know, decades of research to have lower costs for electricity and return more of their revenues to cities than their counterparts, these so-called investor owned utilities. Beyond that, some publicly owned service, services really prioritize equitable access, things like providing, providing affordable internet access to disenfranchised or underserved populations, or something that's particularly relevant today is not disconnecting people's water service if they're having financial difficulties. We've seen that a lot with the pandemic where it's been proven through research that publicly owned water utilities don't disconnect their customers at the same rate as privately owned uh, utilities do. Some publicly owned utilities really prioritize environmental concerns, things like establishing efforts to switch to renewable energy or to lower energy consumption. And so basically for me, you know, taking waste services into public ownership would really give the people of Burlington a powerful social, economic, and environmental tool that they could then democratically decide how best to deploy to address their concerns. And there are a few other reasons, I think, for public ownership that are worth briefly mentioning. And I think the, the first is this concept of natural monopoly. And, and there are certain sectors and geographic areas where, for, for various reasons, technical, capital, you know, environmental reasons, a single provider of a service is really preferable and, and more effective and efficient. And this is often seen, as I said, in the electricity sector, the water sector, and waste uh, sector, among many others. And, and I think it's one of the reasons, I gather, that uh, Burlington is considering consolidating its its waste service. But the problem really is though that when you have a natural monopoly and you place it into private for-profit hands, these natural monopolies become really engines for inequality, unaccountability, and wealth extraction from local communities. And, and even the free marketeers understand this. And, and the most famous of the free marketeers of all, Milton Friedman, he actually once wrote that in the case of these large technical monopolies of vital services, quote, private unregulated monopoly isn't tolerable and that public ownership actually might be more preferable. And these were Milton Friedman's words. Milton Friedman said Milton that Friedman's public words. ownership of these natural monopolies is yeah. more yeah. preferable. Public, public ownership or public regulation for him of natural monopolies was preferable to private monopoly. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, so even the free marketeers got it. And, and I think the, the second important reason for me, a really critical reason, it, it's, it's about inequality. You know, public ownership can really reduce economic and social inequality in various ways. And, and I already mentioned a couple with regards to lowering costs for consumers and, and ensuring that shareholders and wealthy owners don't just enrich themselves off of, uh, off of basic public services. But there, there's another way as well. And this is that in general, jobs in publicly owned services are, are more equitable in terms of race and gender. They have union protections and are more stable and they provide quality healthcare and retirement benefits. And all of these are really key ingredients of reducing inequality that we've seen really explode in our country um, over the past 30 or 40 years. And so just to reiterate for me though, I think all of these things are important, but for me, the absolute most important thing about public ownership is that it's a really inherently flexible ownership form. And as I mentioned, it's not constrained in the same ways as private ownership and can be deployed for whatever reason a community sees fit. And there's this really great E.F. Schumacher quote that's I think really just worth really briefly reading. And, E.F. Schumacher was an economist who wrote the book, Small is Beautiful. I think people might be aware of him up there in, in Vermont, but he said that private ownership of the means of production is severely limited in its freedom of choice objectives because it's compelled to be profit seeking and tends to take a narrow and selfish view of things. Public ownership gives complete freedom in choice of objectives and can therefore be used for purposes that may be chosen. That's pretty darn good. So um, you, you talked earlier about um, the, this being a, um, a national uh, movement, so to speak. So, so I'd like you to put it in a little bit more detailed context in a national and international context and talk about the, the movement uh, for public ownership that this particular issue here in Burlington is a part so we can uh, understand um, if we're alone or we're actually not alone and not an outlier in this. Can you give us that overview? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, first and foremost, you know, there's obviously been a lot of pressure for privatization over the past 40 years, the, the sort of neoliberal period of, of privatization and marketization and liberalization. But uh, despite this pressure, despite this 40 year uh, period, public ownership around the world remains really quite popular and, and also quite popular here in the United States. As, as we mentioned before, I wrote a whole book about how popular and, and prevalent and ubiquitous public ownership uh, is in the US. And, 
And for instance, I, you know, 25 to 30 percent of all electricity in the U.S. is supplied by publicly owned enterprises or cooperative utilities. You know, around 85 percent of people in the U.S. get their water from a publicly owned provider. And that's that's actually substantially higher than many places in the world, like, you know, the U.K., for instance, where they they privatized a lot of their water and had pretty disastrous results with their their water service. And you it's know, the same, I guess, in solid waste in the United States with uh, uh, the, the Department of Public Works had said that a significant section, about 50-50, a little bit less uh, of the uh, municipalities um, are doing uh, their own solid waste collection. I mean, I have relatives in Montana who uh, Billings, uh, and that's a public system. So, you know, the, the, it, it's fairly um, standard in the waste collection system as well. But uh, I, I interrupted you, go on please. Yeah, no no problem. I might talk a little bit about my personal uh, experience with, with waste in my community in, in, in a little bit, but um, you know, just to, to keep going, we have, a, you know, we have a publicly owned national railroad, which again, is something that a lot of countries privatize that they, they don't have. We have a publicly owned poster, postal service, which I know is under a lot of pressure. And we have a, a guy in there right now who's, who's trying to dismantle it, but, uh, but you know, it's it's a it's a gem. It's a it's a, a gem of public ownership that you know generally works very well, and and uh, we need to preserve and enhance it rather than uh, dismantle it and and privatize it. I mean, you know, a, a third of all land in the United States is publicly owned. You know, several states, especially it's like Western Republican states, have these giant sovereign publicly owned wealth funds, like Alaska. You know, that basically has this multi-billion dollar fund that pays out a basic income, a basic dividend to, to every resident of the state of Alaska out of this publicly owned fund. And in Texas, they have a giant publicly owned sovereign wealth fund that owns stocks, bonds, real estate, other uh, you know, land. And they take a billion dollars or so out of this fund every year and they give it to every public school district in the state of Texas uh, to subsidize or underwrite their, underwrite their public schools and ensure that they you know, they can do new school facilities and they can get lower cost bonds and so on. And so, you know, when you have people from Texas come to you and, and tell you that the, the Texas miracle is based on uh, on cutting taxes and, and, uh, and, you know, not having income tax and all those things, they, they don't also tell you that it's also based on socialism <laughs> in Texas. Interesting. <laughs> and, and what about re-municipalization? It's a long kind of complicated word to say or re-public ownership yeah. uh, is there a movement on that as well exactly yeah yeah so remunicipalization as you said a very hard term to to say but it's the process of really taking a service that has been privatized uh, or has always been you know considered in the purview of the private sector and bringing that into public hands uh, usually at the local level and and recently the transnational institute which is a nonprofit organization based in amsterdam that i have a lot of close connections with They've identified around 1,400 successful remunicipalization cases involving 2,400 cities in 58 countries around the world. And, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There are large swaths of the world that this data has not yet been collected for. You know, we're talking probably you know, tens of thousands of remunicipalization cases over the last 10, 15 years. There's really been this reversal. We had this privatization era of the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, and there's really been a pushback, especially since the turn of the century, where lots of communities are have experienced the downsides of privatization. They've experienced the detriments, and they've started to bring back public services uh, in, into public hands. And as of yesterday, when I checked the database, uh, there are 85 uh, cases in that database of remunicipalization in the waste sector uh, alone. And a lot of these cases have been in Canada, actually, and in places like Winnipeg, Quebec City, Sherbrooke, St. John. So I think as Burlington moves forward on this process of remunicipalizing its, its waste services, there's some really great experiences to draw from around the world, but also just over the border in Canada. There's probably a lot of people there who, who have experience with this process of remunicipalization uh, that can assist uh, Burlington uh, and, and provide best practices and case studies and, and so on and so forth. And, and the US is really definitely very much a part of this global remunicipalization movement. You know, I, there have been around 560 or so municipal broadband internet networks that have been developed over the past, you know, probably 10, 10 to 12 years. It's the fastest growing sector of public ownership in, in the United States. And, and many communities, the ones that are not served by the private for-profit telecoms giants, they've been essentially uh, establishing these super fast broadband networks. In some places like Chattanooga, Tennessee, they were the first community in the United States to have a, uh, a one uh, um, I think it's 
gigabit connection, uh, and then they've moved it up progressively. They have some of the fastest internet in in the country um, in this municipal network in, in Chattanooga. And, and because of this, companies are trying to relocate there. People are trying to relocate there. It's a giant economic development engine. There've also been around 70 water remunicipalizations in the United States in, in, a, in the past couple of decades. And I mentioned that you know, the majority of people in the United States get their water from a publicly owned provider, but there has been some privatization. There's been a lot of reversals of that uh, uh, recently as well. There have been new campaigns all over the country in the electricity sector to remunicipalize uh, in, in conjunction with the climate change crisis and also the green energy transition crisis. You know, Chicago, Providence, Maine, uh, there's a big effort in PG, with PG&E in California because you know, PG&E doesn't take care of their transmission lines and they start giant forest fires. And, and there are some really great um, publicly owned utilities in California that are really good examples um, of, of how you can uh, do electricity and water and other utilities uh, in, in much more interesting ways. So there's a big effort with PG&E as well. Public banks as well is a, is a huge campaign. Uh, California has had a lot of success with public banking legislation. There's now state level legislation in California that authorizes up to 10 local public banks to be created. Um, and there's uh, activist campaigns in LA and San Francisco and other places to set up publicly owned banks. And it's actually one of the most vibrant public banking movements in the world. I go overseas and I talk in, in Europe and places and people who work in public banking are like, how do you get people interested in public banks? Why is there such a vibrant activist movement about public banks in the United States? And a lot of it has to do with climate change, uh, divestment, Standing Rock was a big motivation of people, you know, really looking at who are the, the, the funders of these pipelines, who are the funders of climate change, it's the big banks, it's the JP Morgan, it's the Wells Fargo's, and, and who's funding that? Well, you know, all of our city deposits are in Wells Fargo and JP Morgan and so on. So there's a, a very vibrant uh, public banking movement here in the United States. Um, so we've, you've raised you, you've raised a, a lot of things and we'll probably have to have you back because uh, we've we had experience with a public uh, cable company uh, and uh, that uh, an Internet provider that, that didn't go so well. So but there are still people that are struggling for a, a, um, a cooperative uh, program. And so uh, and, and we have definitely looked at places like Montreal for the way they have uh, been transforming their transportation system in relationship to uh, protected bike lanes and have sent people up there. So the idea that Quebec and other places in, um, in Canada have uh, been uh, remunicipalizing their solid waste is something that we'll have to uh, to look at a little bit more closely. So you know that'll that'll be good. Let's um, talk about the, the the hot button items we would need to address in bringing a municipal solid waste system here: cost and service and innovation. Because I know that Burlingtonians want to know how will the city do it you know we are fairly idealistic but we're also pretty practical we want to make sure that it's going to work we want to make sure that we can afford it um and so in looking at if you can do some solid waste um examples but if not uh, other ways how the public is performing their these functions in terms that are as good if not better than the public sector in terms of cost and service and innovation and ecological stewardship, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I think I'll just start with a with a personal anecdote. And uh, I mentioned before that I that I live um, in, in a place. Uh, I live in I live in Virginia, um, and for many years in Virginia, I lived in in the county. So I lived just outside of the city limits of of the local small city. Um, and in the county, our trash collection was privatized, and there was a lot of restrictions on, on what you could pick up or, or what they would pick up and what you couldn't. And anytime you'd have to do home renovations, you, you'd have to load up your personal vehicle, drive several miles away to the solid waste transfer station, you know, pay a fee to dispose of the waste and, and all of that. And then a few years ago, I moved into the actual city limits where we have a publicly owned uh, waste collection system, a very integrated, efficient uh, you know, very, very good system. And they'll literally pick up anything that you put, put on the curb. You can demolish an entire bathroom in your house and put it on the curb and, and they'll come by and, and take that away. And, and a lot of us in this community, we really joke that, you know, one of the major perks of living in the city is our municipal trash collection. It's, a, it's just a funny city, city joke. And, and it's, it's a really effective system. And, and I've, I've seen the contrast between the, the privatized system and the municipalized system firsthand. But what city is that? What, what city is that? 
Well, I live in the city of Fairfax uh, and I used to live in Fairfax County. So I only moved, I think like two miles, but I moved over the city line. And so it, it was a different system and it, it's, a, it's a very, very much more effective and efficient system from a, from a lay person's perspective, for sure. Um, but yeah, more, more generally, um, a couple of years ago, um, an organization called Public Services Research Unit reviewed all of the academic studies and other evidence around uh, waste management. And they found that public waste management performed as well or, or better than private waste management. And this is, you know, 27 or 28 academic studies or, you know, cross country studies, different, different geographies and so on. And, and then the report went on to provide a number of case studies from around the world from very specific places, which showed how some of these public owned, publicly owned services had lower costs than than their privately owned competitors. Some had better service quality than their privately owned competitors. Uh, some have significantly reduced waste generation in their community. Um, I think the example there was, um, was in maybe Sicily or, or Sar no, Sardinia, where they had transferred to a municipal publicly owned system and the community had decided to prioritize reducing the amount of waste uh, that a community was producing. And they had managed to do that through this publicly owned system. Because if you think about it, you know, a privately owned company has no incentive to reduce the amount of waste that you're providing. They actually probably have incentive to, for you to produce more waste, one would, one would think. Um, you know, some of the other examples uh, in this um, from Germany and Austria were that publicly owned waste companies had much better working conditions, better pay, better benefits, better union protections, and so on and so forth. And, and this, you know, this report was about the, the waste sector in general, and I'm happy to provide that and you can send that around to, to, your, to your friends and people in the community. But more generally than that, there is ample evidence that public ownership in general is as effective or efficient as private ownership if not more so. There's an entire, entire chapter in my book that, that you held up earlier, which really tries to, to demolish this myth of the supposed superiority of, of the private sector. And, and that's one of the things that the neoliberals did very well for, for 40 years. They really propagated this myth that the public doesn't do things well and that the private sector is better and that the public sector is inherently more inefficient. But when you actually dive into the academic literature, the empirical and the theoretical literature, there's no consensus amongst that. It's really about design. You know, there can be, I'm not gonna deny that there are publicly owned enterprises that can be inefficient and there are publicly owned enterprises that can be bad. I mean, you know, you look at state owned oil companies and, and extraction, of course, there are definitely publicly owned enterprises that are doing things that are not good and that are corrupt and so on and so forth. But there are definitely privately owned enterprises that are extremely corrupt. Uh, you know, talk about Enron or, or you know, talk about any of the massive uh, scandals that we've had, you know, the entire financial crisis that almost brought down the world economy. I mean, the massive corruption and inefficiencies and ineffectiveness in, in the private banking sector. So it's really not about public or private. It's about design. It's about intentionality. So, um... I mean, and, and of course, they don't have the democratic um, process, those private companies to, uh, to hold them to account. Um, le let me move to, um, I think, the last basic question, um, which is that we really shouldn't minimize the, uh, the effort to stand up a new public enterprise in Burlington. Uh, and we would have to do it in a way that expands on the good work of the existing recycling program, but we'll need voter approval for borrowing authority and a buy-in from an administration that so far is, um, is reluctant. Uh, the, our bureaucracy and more conservative politicians have looked at the steps that we're gonna need to stand up a municipal system as negatives. But um, the question that I've got is, aren't they things like the, going to the voters or going and getting in, uh, you know, surveys and really speaking to people, aren't they really things that we should embrace in the spirit of building a democrat democratic control and ownership over an essential public service, service and, and, you know, our effort to fight climate change? Yeah, definitely. Well, as I, as I mentioned before, you know, there, there are thousands of examples of remunicipalizations from around the world and, and here in the, in the U.S. So Burlington, let me just say this, 100% definitely Burlington can do this if, if it decides 
that, that it wants to do this. And, and we sometimes characterize remunicipalizations as being either pragmatic or political. And it's really kind of academic -y jargon, but pragmatic remunicipalizations are those that are driven mostly by considerations around cost or service quality. They're, they're sort of led by city officials and, and they can be relatively quick and, and uncontro uncontroversial. I mean, remunicipalizations can happen very quickly. You know, a contract comes up or, or you know, a, a city council decides they want to do something. It can happen very quickly. And these probably, these pragmatic remunicipalizations probably make up the bulk of the remunicipalizations around the world. But there's another group, these political remunicipalizations. And these are the ones that are driven by community groups, by activists. They're concerned both with quality and cost issues, but also with questions about challenging corporate power and, and challenging the sort of supremacy of private ownership of public goods. And, and these, these political remunicipalizations, they can be more controversial. They can take a little bit longer. Um, but whether or not a remunicipalization is pragmatic or political, it really has to do with the, the commitment of the community, the commitment of the elected officials, and also the sort of resistance or, or lack thereof of private enterprises that are, that are being displaced. And, and one of the more recent big political remunicipalizations was in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and there, the community and the city council were really engaged in this long-term remunicipalization fight with regards to their electric utility. And, and despite the voters approving multiple referendums on remunicipalization in order to really advance the city's clean energy goals, um, the, the giant energy corporation, Excel, they, they fought it tooth and nail at, at really every turn. And, and it took 10 years. And after about 10 years, voters eventually um, agreed to a deal with Excel that kind of paused the remunicipalization effort um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it paused the effort, but it also won really significant victories and concessions from the companies re with regards to clean energy commitments and so on. But the, the, the lesson for me from Boulder is that even if a remunicipalization effort isn't ultimately successful, it can and it is a really empowering uh, social process that brings the community together to really start to discuss these really incredibly important economic, social, and environment, environmental issues and really begin to chart a path forward in a, in a democratic way, in, in a collective way. And, and it really is the antithesis to the, a, a, remis, a politicized remunicipalization campaign is really the antithesis, I think, to the sort of disempowerment of the neoliberal era, the atomization of the neoliberal era. I mean, Margaret Thatcher, the British prime minister, one of the sort of architects of neoliberals, and once had this phrase, she said, there's, there's no such thing as a society. And, and by this, she, she meant that like, we really should be acting as individuals and looking out for ourselves and, and no one else. And, and this really individualization was really a fundamental underpinning of, of the neoliberal era, era this, this sort of idea that public forms of ownership and control were inherently bad or flawed and that economic and political power should really be wielded by like a small group of elites in, in society. And we've seen the devastating effects of this ideology over 40 years on, on our society. You know, inequality has exploded in our country. We've been unable to get rid of poverty. You know, racial inequality and in economic inequality has it's been stagnant since the 1960s. It's it's really incredible how little progress we've made over the past 40 years uh, economically in this country. And I think COVID also proves it as well, right? Like COVID has proved to us the sort of detriments of this go it alone ideology, whether or not it's each community in the United States is going to go it alone, or each individual family is going to go it alone, or the United States as a country is going to go it alone. You just can't go it alone in a global pandemic. And the crises that are facing us in the future, uh, you know, more pandemics, uh, global economic crises, climate change, these are global in nature, and they're really going to require a collective democratic response. And this is what public ownership is. It flexes that, those muscles. It flexes those democratic muscles a community is going to need and our society is going to need to deal with the challenges ahead. Wow. Um, we're definitely going to have to have you to come back and, uh, and expand on these, the whole question of its relationship to empowerment of uh, black and brown communities here is, um, is also important. And, uh, you know, the idea that uh, public ownership of this solid waste district will be good for those communities um, and uh, is really important, uh, as well as that study. But it looks like we are running out of time, Thomas. Um, this has been great, uh, helpful and interesting. Um, I understand that our city council will be deciding on consolidation uh, in September. Um, 
and uh, we'll need to get a lot of uh, people to, uh, to, to, to weigh in on that. But if it's approved, then the question will be whether um, a public system or a private system and the specifics of that system will come into to, to the fore. And it's likely that there will be um, uh, a vote that may not bifurcate those, but you know that that's the political democratic system that we'll be playing. And so I hope that we can um, have a chance to chat again and that those resources that you talked about um, can be brought to bear on this, like that solid waste study. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add and you get a chance to plug your book again in the Democracy Collaborative too? Because, you know, after all, why not? Well, no, I thank you so much for, for having me and I wish you and, and the people of Burlington all success uh, in this effort. And just I just want everyone to know that uh, you're definitely not alone in this. There are communities across the world who are who are remunicipalizing, who are thinking about public ownership, who are thinking about taking on corporate power. And uh, there's a whole network and a movement and organizations and people standing by ready to help. So uh, just let us know how we can be most helpful and, and we'll be there. I will do that. Thanks very much and uh, have a great rest of the, uh, of the day. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you.